Good afternoon. Uh, did you enjoy the drama? Yes. Uh, our church is famous uh, Sunday worship service drama. <laughs> uh, welcome to this worship service. The title of today's message is God Promised the Seed of Redemption. The key verse is verse 15. Let's read this verse together. Let's go. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. In the previous passage, we learned about God's deep concern for man's happiness. God loved the man, and he provided everything he needed for his happiness. The Garden of Delight, as is mentioned, Freedom, his words, his mission, and even a suitable helper. If Adam needed anything more, God would uh, give him that too. So in God's uh, garden, Adam could enjoy a truly delightful life. Only if he lived according to God's original uh, design. But alas, Adam disobeyed God, and as a result, terrible things happened. In today's passage, we see Adam's fall. When, God, uh, when Adam ignored God's command and disobeyed God's will, things did not go as God had originally designed. As a result, Adam lost everything, and his life became very chaotic. In today's passage, we also see God uh, calling uh, Adam, uh, calling for, uh, looking for Adam, saying, Where are you? This is the shepherd's voice. Even though Adam sinned, disobeyed him, violated his command, God was still looking for him. Let's pray that today we would hear God's vo uh, voice, Where are you? And come out to him. Let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, gathering us here to worship you. Uh, thank you for giving us this chance to study the book of Genesis. You have taught us so many important and fundamental things through the book of Genesis. May you bless us that we may put what we learned into practice so that our life may go in the way you designed and thereby we may enjoy a delightful life in you, Lord. May you bless this worship service with your holy presence from the beginning to the end. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First, the transgression. Look at verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? About the serpent, uh, there are two main ideas. They say that either uh, Satan disguised himself as a serpent, or Satan hypnotized the serpent. But it does not make sense that later God punished the serpent, the reptile, because of this crime. So the serpent, the reptile, was actively involved in this crime. The only clue the Bible offers is the serpent's crafty character. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Many intelligent people think of themselves too highly, so they come up with crazy ideas, suggestions, and theories which are too big for them to deal with and end up serving Satan's desires, bringing great confusion and uh, making so many people turn away from God. Instead of letting their minds go so wild, they should have controlled their inner world, 
knowing what they can think of and what they must not think of. The serpent was crafty. The serpent tried to figure out God's intention in giving the tree and the command. Certainly it was okay to try to figure out God's intention. But the problem was that the serpent did not think of God's intention with absolute trust in God's goodness and love for humans. Fundamental attitude toward the Creator God. The serpent did not control his mind, but entertained all kinds of, all kinds of things, even negative ideas about God, entertaining God's, the doubt of God's love. When the serpent was going this way in his mind, Satan had a chance to intervene and manipulate his mind, making the serpent draw a conclusion which Satan desired. Then the serpent struggled hard to convince the woman to accept his understanding of God's intention, as if it was telling her a great secret. In that way, the serpent, all on his own, pursued what Satan desired wholeheartedly, making these humans violate God's command. This is a warning for all humans, really. As God's creatures, we must approach God's command, God's will, and God's person fundamentally with absolute trust in God's goodness and love for us. Just like little children putting their trust in their parents not to find some evil he might have in secret but to find his beauty and to understand his love for us more and more. That should be our attitude. In approaching the woman, the serpent used the word of God, but not as it was. Since the serpent had an ulterior purpose, it changed the word of God in the way it desired to serve its purpose, saying, did God really say that, say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? By saying this, the serpent implied as if God had restricted them from doing anything in the garden, describing, describing her life miserably, planting doubt of God's intention in her heart. If anyone approaches you this way, describing God, God's people, God's church, God's mission, or anything of God in a negative way, then be on your guard. Behind the scene, there is a Satan trying hard to lead you astray from God, trying to plant doubt of God's love and goodness in your heart. If anyone approaches you this way, implying that your parents have an ulterior purpose in telling you to study hard or not, and uh, not hang out with the gangsters on the street, you'd be really mad. You'd be angry, saying, nonsense, get out of here. Never talk to me anymore. That's what you do. So if anyone does so in regard to things of God, you should do the same thing, really. It seems that the woman should be really upset, rebuke the serpent, and kick it out, saying, what are you talking about, you evil dude? God has given us this entire garden, and he made us the rulers. Never say it like that. But instead, she entertained this kind of twisted conversation, saying, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. In her response, she also used the word of God, but not exactly as it was. She 
omitted uh, freedom God gave her and emphasized the negative aspect of God's command, uh, adding, you must not touch it. God never said that, but she added, you must not touch it. When you think about her response carefully, we can see that she actually had not grasped God's real intention in giving her the command. She did not know God's good intention for, uh, in giving her this command that was for her life life and her protection. She did not know this. As a result, her attitude to God's command was casual. And God's command seemed very burdensome. So she would, uh, he would try to ignore it or not pay attention to it. When she did not know God's real intention in giving her the command, and thereby when she had that kind of casual attitude toward God's command, she was vulnerable. Her failure shows us the importance of grasping God's real intention in giving us his commands. That's why meditating on God's commands, God's words deeply, to grasp God's words really is the most essential for all Christians. When you grasp God's real intention in giving you his commands, there you are overjoyed. Wow! God has deep concern for my happiness. God really loves me. There you are overjoyed, happy, and thankful. And thereby, you hold on to God's commands absolutely. Without grasping it, people just keep God's commands out of duty. Just like this lady, Eve, the first lady. They just keep God's commands out of duty, going through the motion. No real joy. No real things and happiness. Maybe they hope that that way they would go to heaven, not hell. Such Christian life is boring. And such people become nothing but Satan's toys. No wonder why so many Christians' life is very chaotic and painful. 